Hepinize iyi akşamlar. Yapı dünyasının, yapı sektörünün değerli misafirleri, değerli paydaşları. Hepiniz hoş geldiniz. Öncelikle sizlere bu güzel kalabalık, saygın, renkli kalabalık için çok teşekkürler. T buluşmaların ilkinde böylesi güzel bir ilgi gerçekten bizi çok mutlu etti. Ve tabi Kujimato'ya da çok teşekkürler sizleri buraya e, getirdi. E, Şişedam ve Düzcan grubu hakkında kısa videomuzu seyrettiniz. E, bizler de mimari camlar olarak yapı sektörüne çok farklı fonksiyonlarda geniş bir ürünle hizmet ediyoruz. Hedefimiz kaliteli ve e, ihtiyaçları günün ihtiyaçlarını karşılayabilecek özelliklerde ürünler sunmak. Cam sizlerin de bildiği gibi şeffaflığıyla öncelikle güneş ışığından maksimum oranda faydalanmayı sağlaması. Ee, onun yanı sıra sizler için önemli olduğunu düşündüğüm diğer malzemelerle uyumlu bir şekilde kullanılabilmesi, farklı formlara sokulabilmesi, hatta zaman zaman eğilip bükülebilmesi e, ama taşıyıcı bir malzeme olacak kadar e, güçlü ve sağlam bir şekilde de durabilmesi adına sektör için çok önemli bir ürün. Biz de açıkçası bu ürünün e, yapı sektörü için öneminden hareketle e, elbette hizmetlerimizi, ürünlerimizi yoğun arge faaliyetlerimizle ve elbette günün ve sizlerin ihtiyaçlarınıza en uygun şekilde sürekli geliştirdik, geliştiriyoruz ve elbette geliştirmeye devam edeceğiz. Camlarımız e, dekorasyon, gürültü kontrolü e, ve tabii ki günümüz ihtiyaçlarını dikkate alacaksak en önemli ihtiyaçlarımızdan biri olan enerji tasarrufu sağlayan ısı yalıtım camlarıyla hizmet veriyoruz. E, bu anlamda hepimizin e, odak noktası küresel ısınma nedeniyle enerji tasarrufuna odaklanmak. Bütün çalışmalarımızı bizler üretimlerimizde sizler de eminim ki projelerinizde, tasarımlarınızda odak noktası halinde tutuyorsunuz. E, bir örnek verecek olursak eminim hepiniz biliyorsunuz ama e, bu sene 40. yılını doldurduğunu bilmiyor olabilirsiniz. Nitelikli ısıcan ürünlerimiz. İşte tam da bu günün ihtiyacı olan enerji tasarrufuna yönelik gerçekten çok önemli katkılar sağlayan ürünlerimizden bir tanesi. Isı yalıtımını tek cam veya standart çift camlara göre dört kat arttırıyor. Ama hani dört kat deyince belki çok şey ifade etmiyor. Beni etkileyen ve eminim sizi de etkileyecek olan yani elimizde bir sihirli değnek olsa ve Türkiye'de bütün canları nitelikle ısı cam yapabilsek her yıl iki buçuk milyar dolar e, tasarruf sağlayabilir ülkemiz. Ya bunlar tabi çok e, önemli rakamlar, çok önemli kazançlar ama birey olarak bile benim evimin camını tek camdan nitelikli camlara çevirdiğimde doğaya iki tane adet, e, iki adet e, ağaç hediye ettiğimi bilmek bile e, Türkiye'de üretilen ürünlerin veya bu bilginin gerçekten e, enerji tasarrufuna bir derecede olsa bir katkı sağlaması adına çok rahatlatıcı. Evet, e, çözüm ortağı olmak. Düzcan grubu olarak ee, önemli bir hedefimiz sizlerin, yapı sektörünün tüm paydaşlarının çözüm ortağı olabilmek. Ee, bizim uzmanlık alanımız cam. Dolayısıyla e, öncelikli sorumluluğumuz cam hakkında bildiğimiz her şeyi sizlere aktarabilmek. Ama diğer yandan e, camı yapı sektörünün önemli bir malzemesi olarak gördüğümüz için e, sadece cam değil, aslında yapı sektörünün ilgisi e, içinde olan tüm bakış açılarını, tüm gelişmeleri yapı sektörüyle paylaşabilmek, buluşturabilmek. Bu anlayışla, bu da önemli bir sorumluluk çünkü, bu anlayışla son yıllarda Candan Yansımalar ismiyle de etkinlikler gerçekleştik. Referans projeleri, bu projelerin yaratıcılarından dinledik. Onların bakış açılarını, mimariye karşı görüşlerini dinledik, paylaştık. 
Bugün de T buluşmalarıyla bunu biraz daha global hale getirmeyi istedik. Bugün sizlerin eminim farklı bakış açısını dinlediğinizde fikirlerinizi daha da çoğaltacak, belki çakıştıracak çok genç Japon bir mimarı ağırlıyoruz. Fujimoto. Fujimoto bildiğiniz gibi e, tasarımlarını daha çok kullanıcıların hayal gücüne, onların ilhamına bırakmayı tercih eden bir mimar. Doğayla bütünleşik, için dışla bütünleştiği e, yapılar yapmayı tercih ediyor. Evet, tabii daha fazla ben anlatacak değilim. <gülüyor> Açıkçası en doğru olan artık sizi çok bekletmeden onunla buluşturmak. Ee, sizlere keyifli bir bir saatlik dinleti diliyorum. Hepinize tekrar çok teşekkür ederken Fujimoto'yu sahneye davet ediyorum. Please, so Fujimoto stage is yours. Thank you. <gülüyor> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. <gülüyor> Thank you. Uh, Hi, good evening. How are you? Uh, just a moment. I will, I will set up uh, the water. Uh, thank you very much this this evening uh, for inviting me to this uh, really special event, and thank you very much for coming. I think this is the the third time for me to be in Istanbul, and the first time was about 20 years ago. It was just after my school days and i yeah i really like to travel to see the real architecture and the city in abroad so i came here and uh, it was almost one month trip and so in turkey and in greece so the, i stayed here and the impression of the city of istanbul was so powerful so uh f fantastic and uh, that was very beautiful memory for me. It was uh, one of the starting point. I was fascinated by the Hagia Sophia or Topkapi. Of course, it is quite touristic place, but still, it was fantastic for me. And I really enjoyed the Grand Bazaar, not the shopping, but uh, fascinated by the space itself. And uh, because that was the very early days of my architecture career, I just started my office. But of course, I didn't have any, any projects, any commissions. And I didn't know what kind of a architecture or what kind of a concept I will have. So I was young and I was not so, how to say, convinced. I was really unstable. So that kind of a the strong memory in such a period was so, so strong. So I'm very, very happy to come back here again. And today I, I will talk about the, my architecture, of course. And the main theme is transparency. And the transparency is quite deep, fundamental topic in architecture, as you know. Because it is not only just a transparent itself, but the, for example, less transparent or translucent or opaqueness from the window, glass window to the wall, we will have various different uh, type of the transparencies. So architecture, in a sense, is to create such kind of a different kinds of a transparencies to control the openness and close, uh, closeness, or to create the public, or to create the privacies. So architecture topic is, we can say, the topic of the transparency. And, uh, <coughs> sorry. Yeah, the title, the subtitle is Between Nature and Architecture. And it is always, the, again, very fundamental topic. Of course, we design architecture, and the nature is almost the opposite side. But if you think about our living environment, half of our living environment are made by nature. And of course, half of the rest is the architecture. So how we deal with these opposite things together, combine them together to create the rich living environment is very, very important. And I'd like to <coughs> talk about my background briefly. 
I was grown up, born and grown up in the Hokkaido island. It's a northern island. It's full of nature. So, yeah, this is my childhood days background. And then I moved to Tokyo to get into the university. So this is the Tokyo. And you will see it is quite artificial and quite ugly and completely opposite from my hometown. But uh, for me, both of them are quite important. And uh, after learning architecture, and after starting my office, I thought this almost opposite side of my background is coming together. It's like, like overlapping together. It could have the same concept behind it. Because in nature, it's really comfortable because maybe you will be surrounded by many trees, tree leaves, and the small grasses, and the, every small thing are surrounding you in a nice scale. So you feel really protected, enclosed, cozy feelings. And in Tokyo, of course, appearance is completely opposite. But you will see so many small things are surrounding you, the bicycles or these flags and some strange, ugly, small things are surrounding you. So the situation is quite similar. You are surrounded by such a small, many, many, many small things, protected in a cozy scales. So the appearance is different, but the situation is quite similar. Then I thought, the architecture design is not only dealing with these kind of artifacts, but uh, if nature situation and the Tokyo situation is quite similar, we can deal both of them as equal conditions, or we can mix them together, or we can use both of them as a kind of a, the source of the design to create the architecture environment. So that was the starting point for me to think about architecture in that meanings, the combination of the nature and the architecture. And then, that is based on my simple background, grown up in nature and then based in Tokyo and deal with these opposite things together. So today I will, of course, talk about many projects, but most of them has such kind of a beautiful contrast of the opposite concept. Nature and architecture is one of the typical uh, things, but uh, if you think about nature and architecture, then we Think about, for example, outside, inside, or simplicity, complexity, or different scales, the furniture scales, architecture scales, or more urban scales. That kind of a beautiful contrast and trying to find something between that is the topic of my lecture. And this first project is kind of a typical uh, example how we deal with such kind of opposite things together to find out new frontier in between that. Yeah, this is <coughs> the Serpentine Pavilion uh, last year. <coughs> Sorry. Uh, yeah, as you know, this is uh, in London, and every year they appointed uh, different architects to design the summer pavilion for about four months or four and a half months. And the site is really beautiful, surrounded by the beautiful greens in the park, and uh, the program, the function is pavilion. It means like a cafe usually, but not only cafe, it, it will be used for the lecture spaces or event spaces, something like that. So that kind of a multi-use pavilion uh, was the program. And this is the site. Yeah, this is the Serpentine Gallery, Contemporary Art Gallery, and then surrounded by park, and this is the site. So what we did is to create the whole structures by these kind of a really thin steel materials. It is only two centimeter uh, steel pipe. Combine them together to make a grid. And the size of the grids, the small one is 40 centimeter, and sometimes the big one is a double size 80 centimeters. And then, yeah, the whole structures are made by such a, such a huge grid. And you will, ha you will see Run here, we put the glass on it so you can walk on, stepping up or sit on it. And then it has an interior space, of course, coming here like this. And behind this density of the grids, you have a space and then go out from these directions. So it is 
like a, like a cloud. Of course, made by really strong steel structures, but still it is really soft impressions. Yeah, this is from above. And uh, we made the stepping areas on the, on the roof as well. So the sitting woman looks like uh, sitting on the cloud, floating in the cloud, and under the roof, behind this not wall, this is, there is no walls, but there is no windows, but it, still it has the transparency or translucency. So you will see some peoples in, inside uh, of the pavilions. And you will see how these straight line, the grid structures, 90 degree, super artificial uh, grid structures is making finally the softness of like a cloud. So we have the beautiful contrast of the straightness and the softness, or the beautiful contrast of the 90 degree artificial order, and maybe the order of the cloud. It's more like a complex order in the nature. And the process was very, very exciting. The design period was very short, so we have to concentrate a lot. And the conversation, especially the conversation with the, the client, the Serpentine Gallery people was very, very exciting. And we only had the one month for the idea phase. So we uh, created the first sketches in 10 days or something and send it, send it to them. And then we made a phone conferences, phone discussions. And yeah, of course, I sent and uh, I asked, how is this? How do you think? And they said, no. This is not the serpentine pavilion quality. You have to think something different. And I asked why. Why not? This is too much Fujimoto-like, they said. OK. Yeah, you pointed to Fujimoto architects, and I'm Fujimoto. <laughs> I made something, but you don't like Fujimoto. <laughs> Maybe yeah, I will try something different. So then next week, I made some different sketches, send it to them. And then again, they make a phone call. How is that? They said, no. No again. Why? This is too much not Fujimoto-like. <laughs> OK. <laughs> so you don't like Fujimoto, and you don't like not Fujimoto. So maybe, yeah, something between Fujimoto and uh, not Fujimoto will be the, will be the things. <laughs> but of course, yeah, I understood what they, what they say. It is. The Serpentine Pavilion should be something from coming from the architect's career, but at the same time, not just uh, the following project of the previous uh, works, but the something should be something new. So in that meaning, it should be Fujimoto-like, but should not be Fujimoto-like. So we tried it again and again, again, and finally, of course, we agreed on the really highest point, I think. So that kind of a discussion with the client sometimes make me more think about that and uh, more and more, how to say, we can update. This is not the compromising things. This is like a collaboration. And what I thought throughout the process was very simple. We just got a two very simple starting point. One is the surroundings. As I said, it is surrounded by nature. So how to deal with the natures, how to make a relationship to the natures and ar architectural pavilion was the very simple starting point. And another starting point was the program, cafe, and then the multi-purpose space. And I thought, of course, it is a cafe, so people can uh, come here and sit to, to have a coffee or something. But in the cafe, I like to provide more how to say, diverse space where people can behave as they like, not just sit on the table, but uh, yeah, to use the spaces as they like. So it is more like a, like a landscape, I thought. So it is uh, in the process model. Yeah, it looks like uh, the continuous surfaces is uh, getting like a frangeli shape. <laughs> My intention on this model was to create like an artificial landscape where people can sit on or line on or group together to allow such kind of a various different activities there. But it's still like a not yet satisfying because when we think about the beautiful surroundings, this strong surface is really blocking the view. So I, I, I like to go beyond that. And one day, 
I got an idea is to transform this surface into grids. So to keep these landscaping feelings, but to make the concrete surface into grids. Then it is all transparent or translucent, and still you can keep the stepping landscape-like feelings. Not the surface, not the smooth surface, but the you can keep the stepping areas as a landscape. So that was the moment the final idea came out. So starting from the landscaping, but finally could have more communication to the uh, surrounding beautiful greens. And then, yeah, this is the bigger model. So you will see uh, how kind of a transparent or translucent the whole structure is. But the important and exciting point is the translucency or transparency is changing according to the depth of the, the spaces. For example, you will see some of uh, these areas is really transparent, but if it is really dense, then it is getting almost opaque. But some area around here, it is again slightly getting transparent. So the whole transparency or translucencies or where to have more like a wall and where to have more like a window is always changing according to how you feel the depths of the structures. Yeah, here you will see, this is inside. So we have a, the, this kind of a stepping landscaping and the landscaping going up like a continuous surface and then coming down on the another point. So it is keeping such kind of a continuous uh, surface line, but completely changing into the, into the grid. And you will see some area, this area really transparent because the depth is very thin, but some area is really dense. So in this photo, you will see some uh, less dense area as a window, but if you walk five steps away from here, the whole, the depth of the space is different. So you will see some dense area is getting more transparent, or the transparent area is getting more dense. So the whole impression of the space is not like a fixed structures. It's more like a, uh, how to say, moving cloud-like structure surrounding you. It is uh, one of the most amazing point. Yeah, you will see how, yeah, this is a thin, transparent areas. The gradually it's getting more and more dense. So it is not like a window and walls, no clear boundaries. It is, has more gradient uh, changings. And yeah, this is uh, one of the biggest stepping areas. So it is works working as an auditorium like uh, seating areas, but usually it's more like a, how to say, huge seating areas, anywhere you can choose to sit on, alone or together to walk up or a group up with 10 people or something like that. And actually it has a roof, it's almost transparent, but it has a roof because the roof is the minimal requirement from them. So we finally find the solutions to make a roof with a really transparent. Here you will see the shape of the disc, transparent disc, is layering together around here, so many, many discs. Because the size of the disc is something like this, and the layering together uh, on, on it then the rain falls is coming here, but again and again and again falling down, going out into the outside of the, the pavilion. It works, but uh, not completely perfectly. Sometimes the leaking water is uh, coming down, but uh, I've heard some many of the people thought these leakings was one of the, how to say, part of the installations and the intention of the, <laughs> the architects. So, yeah, I'm very happy to have such a positive uh, people inside. But anyway, yeah, this is the view of the, how to say, the opening lecture. So it's suddenly it's changing into the auditorium-like things and the shape of the people is making the shape of the pavilion. And in the evening, it is like that. So it's beautifully light up. So, yeah, this is made by the steel materials, the real things, but in the evening it is almost like a half real and a half unreal, uh, surreal like existence. And in here you will see how we do, how we use the 
small scale, furniture scale like things. The grid size is 40 centimeters, so you can just sit on or you can walk up. So starting from such a furniture scales, but gradually it's getting coming together to create architecture scales. And then it is getting more like a bigger landscaping scales. So the scales, the furniture small scales and the architecture scales and the landscaping scales, such a different scales are integrated together to create such a melting situations. And of course, inside and outside is always, always, how to say, changing, sometimes going through the inside, outside, like a t these transparencies, but sometimes it's really getting really translucent to make a, to work as a wall, protect you. So how you are protected and how you are open to the surroundings is always changing. So this kind of a steel uh, structure, but the dynamic experience is another opposite concept, melting together. And of course, transparencies and opaqueness inside and outside, straightness and the softness and the grid, uh, artificial order and the natural cloud order are combined together. So we try to find out some new quality, new values between these kind of a two existing usual concept. So inside, outside, both of them is quite usual. But if you think about something between inside and outside, then some new challenge is happening. And then, this is a private house. And again, it is quite challenging things, melting the different things together. And this is the middle of the Tokyo, so you will see how small the plot is. It's quite almost like a five meter and a nine meter something. So together with the client, we, at the very beginning, we gave up the bigness of the house because it's small. So we go, try to go to the opposite side. We gave up the size of the house, but we try to achieve the diversities of the house. So we try to divide the small plot in a smaller pieces of the floors and then to make a different levels to create 20 more different areas in this kind of a small plot. And then you could choose diff 20 different rooms, not rooms, but the areas, 20 different corners in your house. So your choice is really, really big. And then it's making your life more rich, we thought. So finally, it is like this. So you will see how the fl each floor is quite small. It's almost like uh, the size of the, the table, the size of the furniture. But if you stack, stack them up, then to create rather bigger volume of the house. So you will see we have 20 different rooms in this small house, or you have only one room with the 20 different corners. But both of them are, of course, the same things. And uh, both of them means clients have more and more choice to, to choose in their daily life, depending on how many people with you or what is the feelings or how open you like to make it or how close it is. Because, yeah, of course, you will be surprised to see how transparent it is. But uh, these physical transparencies are, how to say, combined together with these small, many, many small things. The floors, columns, is quite small. So every small thing is surrounding you, like uh, I described, like a Tokyo I described, surrounding you to create a really soft territory. So if you are inside here, you feel really comfortably protected, even though it is really transparent. And of course, finally, yeah, the clients put some curtains to block the view. But the curtains, well, did well done, because yeah, usually we put the curtains on the, on the window, on the glass. But the he, uh, yeah, he's the client and she's the client. They arrange the curtains, not only the window side, but the more like a layering of the curtains. So some, some of the curtains just to divide this side and the that corners slightly and then three, four layers made by the curtains. Then it is working very, very 
well in this house because the curtains is another element to create the comfortable densities, not only just blocking the view. So sometimes you can just open the curtains on the window side, but the close the curtains one behind or two behind to create the different depths of the houses. So in that sense, it is really nice collaboration with the client to create the comfortable spaces. And of course, these stepping areas could work as, like a, sometimes as a bench or a tables or a shelves, and of course, the smallest rooms. So this room, for example, it has only 80 centimeter high, so it's not high enough for the rooms. But if you are just sitting inside, it, it works. It is one of the smallest study space or something like that. But of course, usually it works as a, as a shelves or something like that. So the meanings of the furniture and the meanings of the room and the meanings of the house is always changing from that side to the opposite side, depending on your uh, interaction to, to the house. So in that sense, the functions in this house is almost infinite, depending on your uh, uh, behaviors, de depends on how you like to use each different corners. So in, a, in that sense, I think the function is not given before our activities. The function is always defined by the interaction between the space and your activities. And then, this is, suddenly, the scale is expanding. This is a project in the Middle East, and uh, this was a competition project, and huge. It is 1.5 kilometer long and huge site, and the competition requirement is to create the shopping areas throughout this site. So it's really crazy, uh, exciting things to design the whole uh, urban fabrics by one architect. But of course, it's a big challenge because we have to struggle with the big scales. And it was the first time for me to do some project in the Middle East, and the first time for me to do such a huge project. So that kind of a first time thing is really exciting because I don't know how I can react to that. I don't know how we can, what kind of things we can find out from such a different climate conditions, different cultural background, and different scales. And finally, we designed the seven, eight huge towers because, yeah, this is a really flat and a flat land, almost a desert. So, like to have some kind of a landmark. That's a very simple starting point. But at the same time, the experience of the shopping is just walking, walking like a Grand Bazaar. But I like to have, if this is such a huge, I like to have nice rhythm of the shopping. So this huge tower has huge void inside. So every, for example, 30 minutes, you will go in to this big void to have a break or to have a tea or something like that. So your experience is more or less something like this, to have a good rhythm, to have a break and to concentrate on the shoppings or something like that. And uh, at the same time, this big void is working as a, a climate controlling tower. It is like a natural ventilation tower to get the rather cooler air from the bottom and then the hot air is going out. So it is working as not just a landmark, not just a, how to say, the big void, but the, the huge air conditioning machine. And the last things was to create the sunshade because in the Middle East it has a really strong sunlight. So we try to use the whole structures as a sunshade. So the, all the glass, all the walls are set back from the, the outside. So you will see so many layers of the arch are coming together to create a tower, but everything is working as a sunshade. And then, I think this is the first time for me to use this arch shape, but the main structures or main geometries is almost the same as the serpentine pavilion. It's made by the grid, small grids, sometimes double-sized grids combined together, or the triple-sized grids together. 
So, in a sense, so different, 100 times different scales, or 1,000 times different scales, but the geometry is the same. To put the small grids together to create the spaces. Of course, in the case of the serpentine, the whole shape is like a cloud. And in this case, the whole shape is more like a tower, but the basic concept is the same. And then, again, the view from the, uh, the void, big void, you will see how these layers of the grids is working as a sunshade. Not only one sunshade, but the layers of these kind of three-dimensional layers of the grids is creating a really, really complex uh, sunshade. And controlled light is coming down like a particle of the light. So it is really amazingly beautiful, I think. And some area we have uh, the huge water on the inside and using the boats to, to do some, I don't know, something. <laughs> and some, some many programs in the middle above. So it is almost like a surreal uh, experiences. And this is like this, the chouette is this kind of a den different densities. Almost the whole shape is made by the particle of the light. So that was the huge competition programs and project. And we send the 20 numbers of the A0 panels, and then we talked about the, the date of the presentations. But finally, at the last moment, they just cancel the whole project. So no first prize, no second prize, just everything stopped and vanished. But uh, of course it's pity, but sometimes it's happened in the architecture, architecture world. And I myself was rather happy to have this kind of a, a crazy opportunity to design huge scale and uh, different climate conditions and the different background. Then I didn't imagine to expand the great ideas of the serpentine into such a huge scales. And I didn't imagine to create th these kind of a crazy spaces. But the background conditions, climate conditions, make me inspire to make something beyond my existing imaginations. So in that sense, throughout the communication with the project or communication with the different cultures, different climate, we can make our imagination bigger and bigger, expanding. So in that sense, the opportunity itself is quite, quite amazing. But of course, it's really pity. So every time I do the lecture in the world, I'm always calling for the client, <laughs> possible for future clients to make it together. It's like a collaboration, historical collaborations. And uh, of course, I imagine some of you has a lot of money, so <laughs> <laughs> you will be the clients, you will be the historical clients, and something like that. Anyway, sorry, it's a joke. Okay, the scale is now coming down into the one of the smallest projects I did, it's a public toilet, public toilet project in Japan. <laughs> yeah, you will see the toilet and transparency here <laughs> and the wall. So this is the public toilet, only one toilet, public toilet. So it's, but for me, the public toilet is very exciting program because beca because <laughs> of course it may sound funny but the public toilet is public everybody can use it but at the same time it is really private once you use it it's really private so we have to think about the relationship between the public and the private so it's really fundamental of architectural topics and of course, the surroundings was uh, like a more countryside. So how to open, but at the same time, how to close it is another problem, another topic. And it is also quite architectural fundamental topic. And of course, we have a nature and uh, we have architecture. 
And maybe inside, when we do toilet, it is another kind of a fundamental nature. So <laughs> nature, architecture, and nature. So it is really dealing with such kind of a fundamental relationship between nature and architecture. So in that sense, the public toilet, especially that kind of a small public toilet, is quite fundamental, exciting things. So I said yes to this project. When I get the phone call from the clients, I just say, wow, this is exciting. I like to do it. And then we propose this kind of a rather crazy toilet. But I have to explain it. Yeah, this is something like this. Toilet and a glass box. And we have a wall like this, surrounding. And it has a door around here. And you can lock the door. <laughs> so <laughs> once you come in, you lock the door. And then suddenly, this big garden is your private garden. And uh, yeah, of course, you can do the toilet here, or there, or somewhere else. <laughs> so it's quite simple strategy. But it's quite simple, but architectural strategies. We just multi multiply the wall, meaning of the wall. Yeah, usually the wall has several different meanings. They block the view and block the air. But in this case, we divide the meanings of the wall in two different walls. This wall is not blocking the view, but just blocking the, the air. So it is just a glass. And this wall, on the other hand, just blocking the view, but not blocking the air. So the air is continuous. You can enjoy the landscape, but block the view. But if you divide the meaning of the wall, and then to create the distances, then you will have kind of a strange, fascinating experiences blocked from the view, from the surroundings, but still you can enjoy the surroundings. That is the, the strategy, simple strategies, and architectural strategies of this toilet. This is the plan. So you have a wall, and the toilet, and that's all. Door, you can lock it. But of course, yeah, if you are uh, emergency situations, it's a bit tough toilet, because you open, finally you open the door, and then you will see 20 meter more, to, to do the toilet, so you have to run 20 meters more. <laughs> but anyway, usually it's, it's, it works. Yeah, this is something like this. And the wall itself is really simply made. It's made by the timber, how to say, pile, sticking into the, the ground and combine them together. So it's really simple, uh, primitive way to make it. And using the transparency glass and keep the existing landscape as much as possible. So this is a door, and you will see the house over there. So maybe you will be afraid that some people from this floor will see it. But we carefully designed the height of the wall. So if you are sitting on here, they don't see it. <laughs> so it's really delicate design. And here, yeah, this is the existing tree. And we designed the landscape more like a very natural uh, green field-like things. And this is a part of the, uh, the city. Of course, this is a public project. And the city government is promoting that city as an art city. So they not only this toilet, but they renovated the art museum, or they put some small installations uh, throughout the whole city. And then they, made, they like to make such kind of a brand of the city as an art and uh, architecture. And this spring, they made the two-month period of the art fair. So invite, uh, welcome many, many people to go around the whole city to find out some art pieces, to see these kind of crazy things, to enjoy the whole city. And of course, at that time, it's this toilet was already very famous, gets very famous, because this is quite strange. So many people came to this toilet using the huge bus, not only one, but the two bus, three buses, parking around there, and then hundreds of the people is just 
come in, not to do the toilet, but to just sit on and take your photos, and then next guy sit on the toilet, <laughs> like that. So it's more like a tourist spot. And then finally, city government people realized, yeah, there are a lot of people, so hundreds of the people. Then, of course, some of the people likes to do the toilet. Of course, they are coming to the toilet so they can do that, but they cannot do that because so many people are there. So finally, they put kind of a movable temporary toilet behind this wall. <laughs> So I think this is the, the first toilet in the world which requires more toilet <laughs> for that. <laughs> so the toilet for the toilet and for the toilet, something like uh, endless, endless things. But anyway, yeah, it was a big success. That means it was a big success. And this is not a permanent, this is a, a temporary, uh, no, not the temporary thing, this is a permanent thing. So. If you like to visit here, then you can come, and then anytime you, you will see, you will do uh, the toilet. And then this is another example to make the meanings of the wall in a multiple layers. This is a private house, but this house has three layers of the wall, the big box, middle box, and small box and with many, many openings. But the openings on the big box has no glass, no skylights. <clears throat> so inside of the big box is outside. So it has trees, like a, just like a, the toilet. Inside of the wall, it's still outside, but kind of a territory, protected territories. And then this middle box has a glass on it. So inside of this middle box is inside, but still outside of this small box. This small box is just a box, but it is dividing slightly inside and outside. So these three box in box box, you will have the blurring definition, blurring boundaries from, from the inside and outside. Here, of course, it is outside, but still inside of your territory. So sometimes you could enjoy such kind of a half inside, half outside experiences. And here you will have in-between spaces, and here you have more deeper inside. So you could choose the gradation from the gradations, very, very outside, very, very inside, private areas, public areas, and in-between, many, many in-between spaces. Then your choice is, how to say, more various, and uh, I think your choice of the life getting more rich, I think. That is the meanings to make the gradations of the wall, because if you have only one wall, you can just in or out. But in this case, you could choose half in, half out, or almost out, but slightly in, such kind of a various different options you have for your life. And this is the place of the in-between space. Here you will see this is outside, but still protected by the wall, so half inside, half outside spaces. And the view from above, it's, it's like a big box, but if you are closer, it's like a translucent big box, concrete box, but it's really light and transparent. And once you are stepping in, then it is like a, with many trees, but still protected by the big box. And if you are in the middle of the house, you will see how the three layers, this is small box, middle box, and big box, and the sky. But this layering of the openings is creating such kind of a multiple uh, particle of the skies. 10, 20 different skies is uh, covering you, and the surrounding things are smaller divided. So finally you feel you are protected by the three layers of the the walls, well, well, well protected. But at the same time, it's open to various different directions. Open to the sky, you were surrounded by the skies, not only by the walls, not only by the architectures, but the sky as well is surrounding you. So in here, we have the both extreme, extreme side, the completely open and completely protected, but we have many, many in-between spaces. And you could enjoy 
the openness or closeness according to where to sit or where, which corner to, to be there or which layers you were there. So you can choose in your life. So that is the richness of the, of the life, I think. So if you think about some space in between, outside, inside, you could have more choice. And that is kind of a new space, I think. So again, yeah, this is half outside, half inside. In a sense, it's the biggest room in this house, bigger than the house itself. But still, it is like a room, garden, in between spaces. So yeah, this is another example to make the walls in a multiple layers, not just only one walls, but three layers of walls to create such a richness of our life. And then I have two more projects. One is, this one is the, the library in Tokyo. It's a library for art university. And uh, yeah, this is really simple library, all made by the bookshelf. So you will see the bookshelves even on the outside wall and inside is like this. Everything is like a bookshelves. Because yeah, I like such kind of a simplicity, the library all made by the bookshelves because the library is the space for the book. So we started the ideas from the bookshelves growing to create the areas for the people, growing and growing, and finally it is like a huge monsters of the, the bookshelves, like this. It is 6,500 square meters, so it's big, but it is all made by one continuous bookshelves. But the key of this space is this openings. It's like a, the house, previous, previous house, with a box in box in box. It has many, many openings, layered, shifting and layered. Then we have, of course, this is a spiral, so we have many layers of the spaces. But with these openings, you will see through that kind of layers, but not, could not see everything, just to feel the depths of the spaces. And then you can feel you are in the middle of the book forest, and then starts to walk around, some kind of a nice expectations, nice feelings is coming from behind the walls because small windows is showing some small part. That kind of thing is making uh, expectations, invitations to you. So you start to walk around endlessly. And I thought the library, of course, is the place where you will search books, find books and read books, but at the same time, the library is like a place of the forest, of the books, where you will walk around in the forest for no strict purpose, but when you are walking around the forest, sometimes you will get some new ideas or you will encounter some unexpected books. So that kind of a unexpected functions it's one of the exciting things for the library, I thought. So how to create such kind of a artificial forest-like structures was the main key for this design. And finally, combination of the spiral geometries and with many, many openings is creating the feelings of the depth and the feelings of the almost infinity is making you, how to say, inspire you to walk around and almost endlessly to, to feel like a forest. So this is like this. You will see how this spiral is making the many, many layers. So you will be surrounded by so many bookshelves, so many books. So if you like books, it's, it's like a book heaven. You're almost in the middle of the books. But if you don't like book, it's like a book hell. It's a, you couldn't go out infinitely from the, from the world of the book. But anyway, it's finished. And it is coming out to the outside and covered by the glass. But if they like to make an extension, they just put a roof on it and make, take the glass out to use the bookshelves as a kind of a extension part. It's like a Luc Corbusier's infinite growing, growing library. Ah art museum. And inside, you will see 
several different layers. This is the one layers with huge openings and another layers and openings and another layers. So it has several different layers, of course limited layers, but the impression is like a, it has almost infinite layers. And the ceiling height here is really high, it's almost nine meter, and the internet area is around here. And then the main area of the library is on the upper level. And uh, yeah, made by the bookshelf with many, many openings. And the ceiling was very special. It has a skylights like this, but it's covered by the plastic materials. So then, of course, it softened the skylights like a cloud, but at the same time, it reflects the bookshelves like this, so through the, through the ceilings. So the impression is like uh, the bookshelf is not stopping on the line of the ceilings, but it is more continuing uh, to the upwards. And then the ceiling is like a soft cloud, softly covering you to make a beautiful contrast of this strong impression of the bookshelves and the soft impression of the, of the ceilings. And then you will see how many layers, these layers, openings, and then another bookshelf, and openings, and another bookshelf, and here, this direction again. And the whole space is spiral. So it's curved and vanished in the end around here. So in every different direction, you have a space, depth of the space, and then the vanishing. You have the depth of the space, and then vanishing. So that kind of a vanishing space is creating the feelings of the infinity, and you cannot stop walking around. But sometimes you stop to sleep. <laughs> yeah, I think this is this photo I like very much because she is representing how comfortable this space is. So, but uh, yeah, seriously, I like to talk about the scale to make this space comfortable. Because this is a spiral. So the, each space between two walls are like a more like a cozy uh, residential space. In this case, it's almost about 4.5 meters something. So it's really residential scale. So every uh, space between the wall is really comfortable fitting to the space for sleeping or reading. But uh, at the same time, the whole impression of the library is like this. It's almost like a widely spreading, almost infinitely throughout the whole floors. And you will see the, such kind of a distances exaggerated by the layers. So more than 3,000 square meters, it is spreading. So you almost couldn't see, you see the end but you are not sure this is the very end because it is hidden, hidden, hidden. So layering of the wall is creating such kind of a vast spreading feelings. So we have two opposite scales, really cozy uh, residential scales, but at the same time, thousands of square meters is spreading endlessly. Then between these two scales, you could choose or you could feel in between scales or you could choose both of them to experience the completely the wide range of the uh, space experiences. And the both feelings, cozy things and wide spreading things, both of them are really fundamental for the library experience, I think. Reading books or endlessly uh, walking around in the book forest, both of them is really fundamental. But it is completely opposite. Try to create the combination of them by the one simple form of the spiral bookshelves. That is the really miracle <coughs> moment of the architecture, I think. Architecture sometimes could realize such kind of a impossible opposite things realized together by the simple form. That is the exciting moment, I think. In the evening, it's the inside is more coming out. Okay, this is the last project. It is the housing tower in the south of France, the city of Montpellier. And we won a competition this spring, and now we are going, doing the design process, and uh, the construction will start next summer. And the city of Montpellier is the 
Yeah, the Mediterranean city, and even the winter time, it's the climate is very warm, and they got a lunch on the terrace outside, something like that. So traditionally, they have been enjoying such kind of a Mediterranean climate. So we try to create the contemporary uh, representation of their life and of their climate. And finally, we propose something like this. It is, you will see so many balconies is sticking out, sometimes sunshade. Some of them is really huge, eight meter long and uh, five meter wide, like a bigger than, bigger than the room or something like that. Because, yeah, they like the life on the terrace. So even though, even in such kind of a high rise buildings, we try to create to re try to respect their lifestyle, to translate their traditional lifestyle into the contemporary architecture. So it is something like that. So many, many hundreds of the balconies is sticking out to create the whole impression. It's more like a, something beyond the usual building, like that. And the site is on the river, and a beautiful river, and the whole shape is a bit strangely curved. That is why the whole thing is making the impression of the, not like a building, it's more like a, like a pine cone or the trees or something, pineapple or something like that. Because the plot is like this. The size of the plot is something like this. But we had already the green belt, green areas alongside the river. So I, like, I just like to keep that, to continue to the, another existing green line. So to, continuous, to make a continuous green line, that is one point. And another point is, it is an existing building. So of course, something is coming here, but try to keep as much view as possible. So then our building is naturally changing the shape in a rather organic shape. And of course, the ideas of the balcony is kind of a really usual strategy. Every apartment has a balcony, so it's not new ideas. But it once combined with this curved shape coming from the site conditions and the huge balconies coming from the traditional local lifestyle, then it is getting really, really amazing new and old typology of the housing, I think. So you will see how the balcony is, is sticking out, not only one from one house, but the two, three from one house. Or the du if you have a duplex, then two different level balconies combined by the staircases. So it is really like a, uh, not just a balcony, it's more like a exterior rooms connected to each other uh, to the extension of the, uh, the house itself. Then from view, yeah, from the balcony, you will see the Mediterranean Sea to that direction, or the opposite, you will enjoy the beautiful mountain view. And uh, yeah, we are now designing a nice privacy shading things, not too much, not to make too heavy, and uh, some vegetations. Because I like, to, I like people to enjoy their life, traditional Mediterranean lifestyle on these balconies. And once, the life is coming out to the balconies, then the whole impression of the architecture is not defined by the shape of the architectures, but uh, could be defined by the various different activities on the balconies. So of course, this whole shape is quite unique. It's really fundamental in a sense. It's really fundamental, but at the same time, it's quite new. So the beautiful combination of the old traditional things and the new concept together. But finally, the whole shape is unique, but my intention is this landmark could be the landmark by the group of the lifestyle itself. Many parcels or deck chairs and tables and something, visitations and the, the conversations, activities on the balconies. So all the buildings are covered by certain activities and the life of Montpellier. Then it is, the whole thing is really 
amazing three-dimensional layers of the life itself. The architecture itself is go behind it, and the life is coming front. And then the local people hopefully will be proud uh, of their life, and then they can enjoy uh, their lifestyle. So that kind of things is, uh, of course, we are designing architecture, but uh, at the same time, we can design the life on it, or we can design the new activities on it, or we can design the connections to the past traditional things to the futures. So that kind of meanings, I like this project because it is really usual, but it's really unusual things together. And this is now, yeah, they will start selling the apartment very soon, so you could buy it. <laughs> you could enjoy it. And I hope you do to buy it, to support the whole project. <laughs> anyway, okay, so I was talking about many different projects. Some of them looks quite different from some of them, but uh, the concept undergoing throughout the whole project is like that. It's like a, how we can find new values between the usual one side and the usual another side. Nature and architecture is really fundamental. Outside, inside, traditional things and the future lifestyles, furniture scales, architecture scales, and the landscaping scales, and the relationship, the public and the private, and the simplicity, complexity, something like that. So everything is very usual, but uh, we could find some new uh, frontiers between in between that. So that is the uh, things I talk today. Thank you, thank you very much. <laughs> okay, so uh, I'd like to have many, many questions <laughs> uh, because the conversation is always quite quite exciting there, over there, yeah. Any kinds of question is fine. Um, uh, hi, uh, I'm Jaran Purgan, I'm an industrial designer, uh, mm -hmm. and at first, thank you for this beautiful and funny presentation. <laughs> thank you. I will have two questions, if you like. Mm -hmm. uh, first one is the one that I'm sure has been asked you before, but I will add a twist. What's the first reaction of your clients about the transparency, especially on the uh, more private and intimate uh, areas like bedroom, bathroom, and mm -hmm. toilet? Mm -hmm. And uh, in the specific example of that uh, public toilet, you made a very smart solution by creating a private garden for mm -hmm. toilet, uh, but that garden uh, can contain maybe 30 standard and blind walled uh, toilets, how did you persuade your client? Uh -huh. And the second one is about the house and uh, how did you solve the weather and climate issues like rain and heating since the house's outer exterior uh, walls have great openings? Mm -hmm. And that's all. Okay, okay. Yeah, the first one, the toilet. The, fortunately, there are basic requirements to make just a one toilet. So they didn't like to have 30 toilets on that site. But of course, at the very beginning, they didn't expect such a thing. They just say, this is a site. And I visited the site, and the surroundings was so beautiful. So I thought it's very pity to make such a, how to say, black box-like toilet. So we started to think about how we can open the experience of the toilet, of course at the same time keeping the, the safety and privacies of the toilet. That was the starting point. And then, fortunately, that area was a countryside. So around the site, they, they had the space. So at the very beginning, they say just, a, yeah, around here is a site, but I saw bigger areas was just empty. So we just propose for a fun. If it is possible, yeah like to use these big areas for the toilet because of that kind of concept. 
And uh, the first, at the first meeting, everybody says, wow, this is very, very exciting and very nice ideas, but maybe it is impossible, <laughs> they said. <laughs> okay, yeah, and uh, of course I was expected, expecting such a, how to say, usual reaction. But then, suddenly, the vice city mayor, she was, she is rather young, maybe younger than, the, younger than me. Vice city mayor passed by, and then, she saw the proposal and just, she just said, wow, this is, sounds very exciting, let's do this. <laughs> and then everybody says, wow, this is possible. <laughs> <laughs> so sometimes, even the public thinks, one person who understands and who can say, yeah, let's go it, and then it is happening. Of course, that is a small project, so that kind of a miracle happened. And it means it is not always like an economical uh, reasons to make an architecture because after the finishing of this project and of course finally we made it within the budget so that was very important <laughs> they said the budget at the, the first meeting they said the budget is something like this it's not big so we tried even making such a big wall we tried to push it into the budget so that is why we make such a primitive way to make a wall but anyway so sometimes the value of architecture is not just a, how to say, economical uh, usual meanings. After the completion of the, this toilet, it's positively, negatively, it's published really, really widely. And then the name of the city, it is usually nobody knows, but the name of the city is really, really widespread. It's something beyond the value of the, the or beyond the cost of the, the constructions. It is, in a sense, it has the meanings. And the second question is, the, in case of the house N, it is, of course, the big box has no glass, but the middle box has glass and the, the skylights, so it has no problems, no rain comes into your house directly in it. And the big box itself is like a, is working like a sunshade, because it is, it has a big box, and of course, it has openings, but most of the sunlight are blocked by the structure itself, and it has a tree in it. So the trees and the big shelves is like a, like a sunshade, working as a sunshade. So in that sense, it is working in, in an ecological meaning as well. And of course, in the winter time, it's the tree leaves is gone, so more sunlight is coming in. So, in, in that sense, of course, not only just satisfy with the basic functional things, but the, we, I like to add more values, physical values on it, as well as more experience, rich experience values as well. Thank you. Oh, and uh, one more over there. There. Merhaba. Hello. Benim ikiden fazla üç tane sorum olacak uygun olursa. Birinci sorum bu ilk projeniz, pavilyon projesi ile ilgili. Hı hı. Konuşmanızın içerisinde sürekli bir iç mekan ve dış mekan kelimesinden ve aynı zamanda bir koruma ve korunmaktan bahsediyoruz. Ama benim şahsi görüşüm sizin iç mekan diye bahsettiğiniz şey aslında bana göre dış mekan. Evet. Bu iç mekanda korunmaktan kastedilen biz neyden korunuruz? Ya yani bana göre açıkçası sesten, görüntüden, görünmekten, bir darbeden korunabiliriz. Ya yani size göre iç mekan ne demek, dış mekan ne demek? Bunu öğrenmek istiyorum. Ee, i̇kinci sorum da bu NA House ile ilgili. Şey, bu kullanıcı odaklı soruya bir ek olarak kullanıcı dışında çevre bu projeyle ilgili ne düşünüyor? İkincisi de açıkçası ev gibi çok böyle özel işlevlerin yapılabileceği bir evin yani programın içerisinde böyle bir yapıyı çözmeye çalışmanız çok ilginç geldi bana. Şahsen ben kendi evimde yeri geldiği zaman eşimle rahat rahat kavga edebileceğim, yeri geldiği zaman pijamayla dolaşabileceğim bir ortam isterim. Hani kullanıcı tuvalet ve yatak odası dışında bir evin gerekliliklerini yerine getirebiliyor mu? Çünkü sizin gösterdiğiniz fotoğraflarda hep pantolon ve tişörtle duruyorlardı. 
Ee, üçüncü sorum da kütüphane projenizle ilgili. Ee, oradaki raflar temizleniyor mu? Kaç kişi temizliyor? Ne kadar süre temizliyor? Hı hı, hı hı. Aha, aha. Okay, okay. Thank you. Thank you very much. The first question was uh, what is that? First question, oh, protected, protected feelings. And uh, of course, for example, in case of the house NA or house N, there is no completely protected areas because of the, the client's requirements. If, so for me, the ideal house has the really wide range of the, such a gradations this side completely protected, so like a, like a box. And then gradually it's, it has a layers of the open, and then on this side it's almost completely open, but slightly uh, protected, slightly covered, or slightly defined the boundaries from uh, the, the urban situations, for example. Then you could choose, if you really likes to do kind of a secret things or private things, you can come into the really deep private areas. And then if you really like open and enjoy the good weather, you can go this side. And uh, yeah, we could say, for example, house NA is like a, how to say, to make this area, if you have this range from the extremely private to the, to the public areas, house NA is maybe making these areas not having super private areas. And house N, N A, yeah. house N may be something like this or something like that. So every time we can choose which area we can cut out to make it realized, depending on the client's requirements. And of course, recently we have more and more international project. And uh, then I will get, I get more international, uh, more requirements to have the really protected bedrooms for, for them, or two, three bedrooms. Then, of course, I start from this end, but how to include this side is still open, and uh, it's still open to our, our creativity. So in that meaning, yeah, it is the house NA or house N is not the final answer, but it is just an example to create such a gradations or soft territories but it is not the, how to say, answers for all. So even for me, the house NA is too, too open, so maybe I like to have one box inside <laughs> of, that, of the house. So maybe it is the answers to the, to the second questions. Yeah, in case of the house NA, it's, it's quite, quite open. But the thinking about the surroundings, it is in the middle of the Tokyo situation. And as I said in the very beginning, the first image, the Tokyo situations are made by many, many small things coming together to create the soft territory or soft living environment. And that house is also almost the same way to make the, the living environment. So in that sense, it doesn't look like uh, the neighbor's house. It's so different from a neighbor's house. But how the space are made is quite similar to how the Tokyo uh, urban situations are made. So I think in such a deeper, deeper meanings, it is responding to the context surroundings, I believe. So sometimes that kind of a, how to say, deepest connections could work. Because in Tokyo situations, all the neighbors' private houses will be changing, will be replaced in 20 years or sometimes 10 years. So all the neighbors is changing. So we couldn't depend on the physical things of the neighbors. We just depend on, or we just can based on the basic concept how the Tokyo urban situations are made. So that is my strategies. And uh, the last question of the library, yeah, how to clean it? Of course. <laughs> Yeah, thousands of the people don't have to work. <laughs> because, of course, it's the same discussion happened during the design process. And then we did a research at the existing library of the old library of the university. And then we checked the dust on the bookshelf, on the top of the bookshelves. Maybe it has, doesn't ha didn't have 
the cleanings for 10 years, for example. And then it was almost one millimeter. So then we said, no one millimeter, but 0.5 millimeter something. So we said, in 10 years, you have 0.5 millimeter dust. So if you don't like, you can clean it in once in 10 years. So you don't have to worry too much about that. <laughs> And I believe they didn't, they didn't any cleanings on the, the bookshelf, but it, it's still no problem. So maybe our researches uh, may make some, some result, I believe. But of course, if you like, you can, you can clean every day and uh, to make it perfectly something. Okay. <laughs> then, <laughs> thanks. Some other questions? Or, uh, oh, yeah, here. Um, thanks very much for your presentation. Thank you. Um, I'm kind of working on housing, mainly focusing on the time period after World War uh, II. And um, looking from this geography, uh, I find uh, Japanese, modern Japanese housing um, very fascinating. Um, I know this might be a big question to ask, even we can say still a big question, but um, where do you think this is coming from? You know, um, we can say that maybe um, combining the tradition and mm -hmm. the technology well, or what else? What mm -hmm. do you think? Oh, you mean what, what is coming, this, what is this kind of a crazy Japanese house, house is coming from? <laughs> yeah, also you're lucky to have clients to ask for you to design public toilets like that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Actually, in Japan, we have 99% of the Japanese people just like to have a usual houses. But only 1% of the clients likes to have something more, something new or something fit to, to their life. And uh, of course, the, fortunately, the clients coming to me is already checking my uh, previous works. And then they thought, well, this crazy guy could make some uh, crazy things for them. It is the starting point. But of course, it's not just the crazy things, but uh, yeah, the first of all, Japanese plot is quite small. So even though we tried as much as possible, but the usual house is just a small usual house. Then some of the people think, I don't want to have a small usual house. Even small, but kind of a, some special aspect, special point I like to have. That is the starting point. And then, of course, what is special is the problem. Sometimes the special things for, for him and different from the special things for them, but the conversations between the clients and the architects could make the crystallize some special things only based on the site and based on the clients and based on the architects. So it is like a collaboration. Then finally, some really unique answer is coming out. So in that sense, such kind of a Japanese, a poor situation of the plot is, how to say, push people to make something more and more, something so different, special things. But of course, at the same time, the Japanese traditional things is also somehow relating to uh, the Japanese contemporary architecture, I think, because that kind of flexibility or openness or a nice ambiguity has still kind of a value on our life. But of course, the traditional Japanese and our contemporary life is completely different. So architects have to re-innovate or re-translate traditional things into the contemporary architectures. And that is the field of the creativity, I think, to re-innovate things. So there is maybe another, another thing. But I think, yeah, recently, again, I got more and more international uh, commission of the private houses. And the most of the such uh, international uh, clients also like to have such a special things different from a usual house. Of course, like to have a usual bedrooms, but still have something more, more. So I feel it is not limited in Japan, but internationally, many people like to have special house and the good quality of the architecture and like to experience such a special feelings of architecture. So 
in that sense, I'm very optimistic about architectural design. And, and hello again. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. One more question. I, actually, I have two questions if we ha all mm -hmm. have time. Yes. The first one is, you know, uh, constructability, budget issues, and some, for example, municipality limitations and everything. These may be sometimes uh, inspiring, but as well as blocking and limiting for mm -hmm. the designer. So mm -hmm. uh, sometimes there are two dead ends uh, with, mm -hmm. with uh, avoiding them all and endless imagination with no constructability mm -hmm. or uh, having them at the very beginning mm -hmm. uh, which uh, result with limitation of the design and, and imagination. So in what stage do you prefer to include them in or are they uh, with you all the time or you let yourself free and at one point you say, oh, let's, uh, let's uh, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. see if this is in budget or the, if the municipality uh, is okay with this or the constructability. Mm -hmm, this mm -hmm. is our, my first question. Mm -hmm. The second was, is coming to the house and again, mm -hmm. it was in a, in a really strong uh, neighborhood with a strong identity. So it yeah. was actually a, a response or more a reaction to the to the neighborhood, and it's an inspi inspiring space as well, but what uh, about its relationship uh, with the neighborhood between uh, its relationship with the nature itself? Mm -hmm. it's, mm -hmm. it's an artificial nature it has around it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So this, these are two questions. Thank okay. you. Okay, thank you very much. The first one, the regulation, restriction, everything. Yeah, of course, every architecture pro project has such a restrictions the budget and the regulations and the climate conditions and the requirement, everything. So I just, how to say, like to have it. And uh, based on that, I, I like to start. So every restriction is not the restrictions. It's just, a, sometimes it's, it is part of, the, part of the inspirations. So I, I like to be very positive because if we think it is just the restrictions, it's not very fun to, to think about architecture. So I, I just like to enjoy uh, that kind of a restriction. Sometimes it's really low budget, then I like to think about something uh, only possible in such a low budget or different strategies. It is also very creative. Like a toilet, it is rather a low budget, but uh, try to maximize the experiences through that side. And of course, the size of the project is also quite small. It's almost like a five square meter something, inter interior space, less than five square meters. But still, we have a lot of things we can do, we can propose. And uh, the second one is the neighborhood. Yeah, house N or house NA, it's both of them quite, how to say, beautiful contrast in a sense, or a bad contrast between the surroundings. And uh, fortunately, for example, if we design something in Paris, I like to respect the city of Paris, and I like to make kind of a conversations between the history of the Paris. But as I said, in Japan, the residential area neighborhood is always changing in 20 years, for example, something. So if you, how to say, follow, if you, try to fit to some neighborhood, but 20 years later, everything is gone and you will be in the in lost. So for me, it is more important to think about how will be the future ideal or possible living environment or what is the new typology of the, the private house in these kind of uh, uh, site conditions. Then we could propose for the future and if our proposal is attractive or powerful enough, then step by step, the neighbors could take the similar strategies, for example, to create the harmony with the surroundings. Of course, some of them don't take the strategy, so not the perfect harmony, and I don't want to force everybody to follow uh, my strategies. But yeah, and the Japan, Japanese urban fabric is, kind of a beautiful diversity is, is the character. So in that sense, it is a really Japanese uh, maybe situation, but uh, I just 
make it, let, let, let, it, let it be like that. Of course, it depend, depends on the situations. In Paris, different. In LA, different. In Sao Paulo, different. But every time, to think about how to understand the context or how to understand the neighbor's surroundings is very, very important, I think. OK. Oh, some, some more around there? Hi, um, thank you for such an inspiring lecture, first of all. Thank you. Um, my question is about the Serpentine Pavilion. Mm -hmm. um, my question is about how you felt about creating something so beautiful and putting so much of yourself into it, and knowing that only a certain amount of people would be able to go visit it because of the time limitations. Mm -hmm. Like, did it upset you when you saw it being come, like, when it was being brought down? Mm -hmm. And like, what are your thoughts about um, transience and permanence in architecture? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, actually, it was really beautiful and amazing experience. And of course, I was there only the week of the opening, and uh, that memory was one of my lifetime beautiful memory. And for me, of course, it, now it's gone, and it's somewhere in the storage, but uh, I don't care so much about that. Of course, I like more and more people can experience such a historical, beautiful structures. But anyway, it is like that. And it is like, a, how to say, from the beginning, it is a limited thing. So, but the more important things for me is to create the basic concept and to realize it. And I myself or some people experience it. So then people can describe it or can have the influence from that or to create something inspired by that, such kind of a, the continuity of the histories. Even though that architecture itself has gone, but the, the influences or the impact is continuing, I think. So in that sense, I, I, don't, I don't care so much about how to say it is just a temporary or it is gone. And fortunately, the pavilion itself has bought, has been bought by the collector. And uh, she is now planning to rebuild it in the site of the, in the south of France, maybe next year or the next next year. So, of course, the situation is getting different, but uh, you will see it again, yeah. So, in, in that meaning, it is, it is still surviving, I think. Thanks. And, yeah. Uh, hello, my name is uh, Ramzi Sharif. Mm -hmm. I'm an architecture student. Yep. I have a question concerning the uh, Serpentine uh, Pavilion. Mm -hmm. uh, in the design, like there's uh, so much use of dense pipes in such areas. Mm -hmm. And the concept of transparency, like do you think uh, these dense panels somehow disturb uh, the natural view around or maybe uh, distracts the, re uh, the viewer's attention when viewing these uh, dense pipes inside. Mm -hmm. Thank mm -hmm. you. Oh yeah, actually, you, you don't have the clear view to the surroundings in a sense. So for example, if you have some iconic buildings or if you have some access to make clear view, then we have to find some nice way to, to make it clear. But uh, fortunately, the surroundings was like uh, many, many beautiful trees. So even though it is how to say, filtered by such a many structures. You can see it or you can feel it. And uh, that was the very amazing moment. Almost the structure itself and the greens are melting together to create such a, such a soft boundaries. It was, it was an amazing moment. But of course, if it is on the, how to say, in Paris, on the axis, maybe I could make one clear uh, openness to make the beautiful access to the, for example, Eiffel Tower or something like that. So it is depending on the, on the situations. But sometimes we can feel the atmosphere as atmosphere. And we can physically feel the atmosphere and a mixture of different materials uh, together. That was surprising, even surprising for me.
Okay, the last two questions, yeah? Konnichiwa, Homo wa Nihongo de Kikitakatan des Keredomo, Tokogo de Kikimas. Bis Birinji son of Mimar Liko Rangeleris. Bis Birinji son of Mimar Liko Rangeleris, this is the Orangelic Ayatunus Bonjanus, the Gatridge in Sanga Shamala at Latunus. I will not condemn his attack of Sailor in his Neller Olabilis, only Sarmak Steer. Sore de Ato de Ishunishashim Motote, Yoshin des Keredomo. Uh -huh, uh -huh. <laughs> okay, okay. Yeah, I understand, I understand. Yeah, when I was a student, when I was a student, I, I was influenced by Le Corbusier and Mies, Mies van der Rohe and uh, Louis Kahn, that kind of a really, how to say, masters of modern architecture. Because in Japanese university, we started the education of architecture from them and Frank Lloyd Wright, of course. So uh, that, that kind of, a, how to say, historical guys were the hero for me. And I myself was, yeah, in a sense, it's a very, very good student. <laughs> I did the really hardworking, and uh, I did really surprising things. But, sorry, it's half joke, of course. <laughs> But yeah, I, I was very good in school. <laughs> <laughs> but of course, good in school doesn't mean anything because I feel I learned and I thought and I created much, much more after the school period than the school period. Yeah, after the school, I was for about seven, eight years, I was almost alone. I didn't work for anybody. I didn't go to any other schools, just alone to think about the concept of my future Fujimoto architecture. And uh, throughout that period, that was very strange uh, period. Really isolated, but full of time and think about some dreamy things and uh, to create the starting point of my architecture things. That, that was a very beautiful moment. But of course, the, in my student days, I just got the, how to say, passion for architecture. That was the most important thing, I think. I got a really big passion. I like architecture, I like to do architecture, and I like to create some new architecture, surprising things. That kind of uh, motivations and passions are created in the school days. Then afterwards, 10 years, no projects, or uh, hundreds of competitions, losings, is no problem, because I just like to do uh, architecture. So in that sense, yeah, in your school days, you can just create your passions, or you just give up architecture. I think, yeah, you have both uh, choice because architecture is for, not for everybody. Arctic, if you like architecture, you do architecture. If you don't like architecture, you, don't do, you do some different things because you, we have hundreds of different professions. I just like architecture, so I did. And one more thing is, hope you to learn and experience the history of architecture. That is the most important things. And you have, fortunately, you are lucky because you have the old historic area of the Istanbul. I was dreaming for years and years in the school days and finally I went, I came here after the school. But you, yeah, you can go tomorrow to see such a great historical things. And of course, not only the Istanbul or Turkish things, but uh, you will see the whole history of the architecture. And that is quite amazing. <clears throat> so I hope you, I recommend you to enjoy, not study, but enjoy the historical architecture. And every historical architecture could be the inspiration. OK, thank you. And then the last one, maybe there, over there.
Merhaba. Ben Şerif Özata. Ben sunduğunuz projelerde taşıyıcı sistem hakkında bir soru sormak istiyorum. Birincisi yarışma projenizde, bir değeri ise Paris'teki Fransa'daki projenizle ilgili. Yarışma projenizde fark ettiğim kadarıyla konsol girişler üzerine tekrar konsol girişler çıkarak çok geniş bir açıklık geçmişsiniz. Bunun taşıyıcı sistemini çok merak ettim. Nasıl çözdünüz bu problemi? Çünkü algıladığım kadarıyla çok büyük bir açıklık geçmişsiniz. Fakat burada sürekli devam eden bir konsol giriş kullanmışsınız. Bir ikincisi de Fransa'da bildiğim kadarıyla deprem riski yok ama Yine e, binanın etrafında konsol, balkonlar çıkmışsınız. Bunu taşıyıcı sistemde bu problemi nasıl çözdünüz? Hı hı. Bunu merak ettim. Teşekkür ederim. Yeah, of course. Architecture design is deeply relating such a technical or engineering things. And uh, fortunately, I have a very good engineering partner. And uh, I myself, of course, somehow understand the basic uh, things of the structural things or basic things of the ecological <laughs> ventilations and uh, something like that. Then it is like a collaboration. Our visions, we have our visions, but the structural engineer says something, but uh, we counter propose something. Is this possible or these possibilities? something, something. So such kind of a discussions is making the ideas more and more reach to the higher point. So, yeah, finally, recently I realized architecture design. In my school days, I like to do my architecture, de architecture design by myself, only by myself, control everything. But recently I'm more and more enjoying to have a discussion, collaborations, because many people has its own ideas and sometimes some ideas is something beyond me and then I get an inspiration from them so the collaboration discussions is creating my ideas it's really powerful or to make a jump to some unknown places and it, not only the design but the engineering things and the uh, ecological strategies or landscaping things everything is like a collaborations so I Yeah, hope you maybe in future to learn such kind of a excitement of the collaborations and the, the excitement of the, how to say, to get, make your own ideas much, much expanding through the, through the discussions. And of course, yeah, technically it's just, just solve it uh, according to the concept. <laughs> and you don't have to compromise You have your visions, and then you talk with the engineers, solve it to find the new solutions, new materials, and something like that. It is the things. It's really how to say necessary and really exciting. Okay. <laughs> Finally, thank you very much. I really enjoy. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yeah. Ah, okay. Yeah. Okay, yeah, I have to stay here. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Actually, I, I would like to thank you once again. Thank you really, very much. Really, it was a great presentation, projects, and then it was also a great pleasure to meet you. Thank you. On this meeting, yeah. team meetings. And also, uh, as a member of tonight mm -hmm, for mm -hmm. two uh, yeah. tea meetings, tea mm -hmm, conferences. Mm -hmm. We have a small thing. Ah, okay. And it's very simple. Wow, we yeah. Actually, we told a lot on this. Mm -hmm, yeah? Mm -hmm. <laughs> but it's so simple, but right. meaningful. Actually, yeah. we decided, to, at the end, we decided to use just mm -hmm. steel and glass. Mm -hmm, yeah, mm -hmm. I see. Okay, okay. Yeah. <laughs> and then, Wonderful. thank you for thank you very your much. valuable time, thank participation. You. Really, we enjoy. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you very thank much. Thank you to you also. Thank you. Wow. <laughs> Beautiful. Thanks. Thank you. Please, I think mm -hmm. he's taking a photo. Ah, okay. Photo, photo. Yeah. Okay, okay. <laughs> yes, yeah, show like the this. glass. And yeah. yeah. Thank you. Teşekkürler. Thank you very Değerli much. Değerli katılımınız için sağ olun. İyi akşamlar.